before I start sharing my screen, hello and uh, welcome to everyone. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little challenging that I can't, I don't have as direct a relationship with you. I'm, I'm broadcasting a little bit, but uh, I look forward to hearing your questions and seeing your comments and, uh, and just talking through some of the things that I'm talking about. So Jane started us off with the really, um, with all a, a lot of really good practical suggestions for the how-to of online. And that's those are so important. And it's a good way to start to get off and running. Uh, for my presentation, I'm gonna pull back a little bit uh, and talk about some of the higher level ideas uh, about uh, why should we even be teaching online? Um, so uh, many of us have, um, hang on, I just wanna shuffle my screen a little bit so I can see. There we go. That uh, just took a moment. Great. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about why teach why teach virtually. We're human beings, and we love to be face to face, and we love to see each other and hear each other, and be able to look in each other's eyes and talk about things that really excite us. Uh, and so when we teach virtually, some of that starts to shift, uh, and it becomes a little more challenging. Uh, sometimes a lot more challenging, depending on your your internet connection. So um, welcome, and it's so nice to meet all of you, and I look forward to spending time with you during this week as part of the course facilitating discussion uh, and other things we're going to do together. All right, I need to just be able to go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am, uh, I live in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, and that is about five hours north of Toronto, if that helps you at all figure out where I am in the world. Um, and um, I'm very privileged uh, in a lot of, in so many ways, but in, in to live in Canada and to live in a city, a small city in Canada where we, we have not had uh, as many problems with um, coronavirus as, as some other places have. Um, I have been practicing educational technology, instructional design, open educational research and practice uh, for many years, uh, but also have also been an online student for the past, um, eight to 10 years working on a master's of education, a doctor of education. So I really understand the student learning perspective uh, in an online context. This is different obviously for students, especially students in, in primary school, the very youngest ones. Learning online is, is an extreme challenge for them. Secondary students, a little less, oh, but still quite challenging as we get to post-secondary. Uh, it's a little better in terms of access and things like that. Please feel welcome to connect with me in the course shell for this course uh, and through my email, and those are shared in my presentation as well. Sorry, I'm not getting the hang of moving my slide along. Bear with me. Oh, I know what it is. It's that. So the thing, the first thing I want to talk with you about is why virtual, why teach online, what, what's important about that. And I'm going to look at my notes a little bit as I go along, so I don't want to forget something that, that I laid out for myself. And again, this is about organization that Jane talked about. Um, so the shift in 21st century economies uh, and how they're managed and, and what's important to them has involved technology at a very high level, uh, especially around how information is shared, important information for, for things we need to learn and things we need to manage. It has become very important to be digitally literate. And that is important for all human beings from a very young age to, to the very oldest. Uh, I have lots of good friends in their 90s who love their computers uh, as a means of communication with their families and friends. Um, to understand how to use technology and how to find and share accurate information. And that couldn't be more important as we talk about coronavirus and other global issues, sustainability, climate change, those things. We need good science and we need to know where to find accurate information. Online empowers connections with diverse humans across the world. So um, 15 years ago, this session would not have been possible. I, it would have been very difficult for me without traveling to meet you and to talk with you. Uh, and so it creates and to learn from you more importantly. 
uh, online empowers access to diverse knowledge. So um, the internet, um, developed countries, uh, access to computers, all of that has been very privileged and very white for a very long time. And it has become extremely important that more diverse voices, people of color, people from economically developing nations who have such great knowledge to share uh, are able to do that more easily. And that's one of the things that virtual empowers, which is really one of my favorite things. Um, online learning can be flexible in terms of time and place. And again, this depends on your access to the internet and devices. Um, but it creates um, a situation where if you have the time and can have downloaded a podcast or downloaded something to read, uh, you can do it anywhere, especially commuting. So if we're going back and forth to work. Um, and then a pandemic happened and, and this has had a shocking impact uh, on, pr on privileged people. <laughs> So um, uh, in people in economically developing nations, they have had a very spotty access to internet, not access to devices. So they are um, extremely well equipped to be resilient and to find ways to learn. It's been rather a shock for developed nations to have to figure this out very quickly. Uh, and then human to human contact um, in this pandemic has become dangerous. And so, so we, we almost have to go virtual. And rather than going virtual, um, complaining about it and worrying about it and, and feeling super challenged by it, um, I wanna talk with you about ways that we can talk about it in a positive way. Why go, why go virtual is, uh, is a very positive thing. Um, so again, I just wanna, I do wanna acknowledge, and I think it's really important, especially when designing courses for secondary learners um, everywhere in the world, what about those who don't have access? And so lack of access is what, what we call a wicked and complex problem in the world. Uh, and again, it will be familiar for many of you uh, as it is now for, for, e for us even in Canada. And so again, we're learning how, much, how, mu how little access there is for uh, rural learners in Canada, how, how restricted access can be for our indigenous First Nations on their reserves in Canada. Uh, we're trying to help them learn, but then we realize they don't have internet access regular, on a regular basis. So as educators, when we create learning materials, thinking through how can I create this in such a way that if a, that if a learner only had access once per week, they could download, share, read, and use those materials. So I try to think about that um, when I'm designing things. So if it's important to create virtual learning for the reasons that I walked through, how can it be created well? What is good about it and what is great about it? And the things that Jane described and discussed for you, ways that you can design well for your online learners, um, ways that you can design empathetically and with great care for your learners uh, are some of the ways I wanna talk about how that gets designed well. So one of the things that I'm going to hang my hat on uh, for my talk quite a bit is this idea of affordances. And uh, it's a big word, and it just means um, what things what works well in online environments. Um, and in fact, work, what works well in online environments that's almost hard to do in face-to-face -face environments. So there's some things that online and virtual environments do really well that we can't even do in face-to-face -face teaching and learning and, and interactions with humans. Um, so I wanna, again, highlight that positive idea about what works well in online. And it's, you know, there's a lot of big words in this. <laughs> so this comes from a presentation uh, uh, by William Cope and Mary Calancis. Uh, they are Australians and, and they have been talking about this idea of of, of the affordances of e-learning, why e-learning uh, has really some really great features to it. So the first one they talk about is ubiquitous learning, uh, which means you can you can do it anytime, anywhere. Uh, and then this young woman pictured in this is using her, her play tablet and riding her bike at the same time. So she's playing, learning, uh, riding, which I wish I could do. If I had a tablet on my bike, I might I might go biking more often. Uh, but humans are learning creatures. This is not new. So how do these, these digital affordances um, magnify the opportunity for learning anywhere, anytime? So personal computers are a game changer for humans in terms of formal learning, and students can, can move in and out of classroom spaces if they have access to a device. Um, without having to worry if it's happening at a particularly scheduled times. In terms of informal learning, 
Um, there's all kinds of learner choice. And I, you know, if I don't know how to fix my dishwasher, I go to YouTube. <laughs> Lots of humans do that now. If I'm not sure how to do something, I need to learn how to use, uh, you know, a Photoshop a little bit better. I go straight to YouTube and uh, it's quite an amazing thing. Uh, mobile devices are certainly a game changer and certainly a very, very important device in, in economically developing countries where, um, where again, there's commute time, uh, you know, this is true everywhere, but there's commute time, there's time uh, for, um, for interacting with friends and learning with and from friends, which is still important, but mobile devices really make that much nicer. Um, this access to more experts, diverse opinions, and media-rich information. I can watch a video on YouTube um, from Sir Ken Robinson, one of my favorite educators, very easily. I don't have to connect with him. I don't have to meet him in person, but I can learn from him. Uh, and so some of the these learning habits that we can think through and partner with our students to try and develop a little better um, are persistence, right? Sticking with it. Discernment, so learning good quality from bad quality um, in terms of information you find on the internet. Questioning, researching, uh, respecting and embracing and um, diversity. Uh, independence, so I can be a self-directed learner. And then collaboration, and I think collaboration is one of the, of the really nicest parts of virtual learning. So active knowledge making is the second thing that Cope and Kalansis talk about uh, in terms of why, uh, why virtual may be better. So, um, so consuming information is something we do all the time now, but what we really wanna go for uh, in our teaching, in our practice in, uh, as humans is producing knowledge. So that's much more interesting to people. So just making sure that you're, you have opportunities to write uh, and to write well and to get feedback in your formal learning. Um, so you as teachers wanna give that rich feedback, encourage students to write about things that are interesting to them uh, and find ways to relate what your students are interested in to the topics you're trying to teach them. Um, so we really want to shift from this passive consumption to active meaning making. Um, and so workplaces are becoming much more collaborative. Uh, there's almost nothing I do with my teams these days that I don't ask for their feedback and try and improve what I'm doing. Um, and taking risks, active knowledge making is, is taking a risk. Uh, and it's a cultural shift for, for lots of people, especially in my world, I work in formal post-secondary. Um, it feels very threatening to some professors that their students might know things. <laughs> so, uh, so I encourage you not to feel threatened that your students might know things. They will know things and, uh, and they will be more creative if you give them opportunities to do that. So active knowledge making is one of my favorite parts of virtual learning. Um, multimodal meaning. And so, um, in as pictured here, I can I can see this beautiful poster that talks about um, Einstein's theory of relativity. I could read a book about I can read his original work about it if I could understand it, <laughs> which I can't. But if I could, I would. Um, so that's really great. I can find even on the internet now the primary resource. Um, for Albert Einstein's work. Uh, or I can watch a video that just kind of celebrates this, this idea of relativity. But all of these different means of learning um, can be embedded in one simple course shell. You can see in our Moodle shell, we've got video, we've got images, we've got text. Uh, and these different ways of learning are, are really enhanced in the virtual world. Recursive feedback, again, that's, you know, really big words um, from Cope and Colansis, but what they mean is replacing this idea of, of multiple choice exams or tests or writing a paper that gets an A or B or a C, which is just a way of judging a student's work, um, and replacing that with, with iterations and loops of feedback. So ask your students to ask, ask their friends, their family, how is this paper that I'm writing? How could it be improved? Uh, and this idea of feedback works very quickly if, if people have access again, but works fairly quickly in virtual environments. It's easy to, to give quick feedback, to take a look, to use short writing examples, to improve people's work, uh, to keep them engaged and to create social relationships uh, among the students. So feedback becomes very important and all of this can be documented in some place like a Moodle course shell 
uh, asynchronously even, which is so it doesn't have to be live. And again, this is great if your access to the internet is, um, is not very regular, not daily. Um, and so this is also this feedback idea and students creating original work and projects helps with academic integrity, which has become a big issue in online learning uh, in many places. Is the student doing the, oh, their own work and so on? Collaborative intelligence. This is, and again, this is one of my favorite things about virtual and online learning. Um, we are smarter as a group than we are as individuals. Um, and it's harder work to collaborate and to work as teams on things, but it's such an important human skill because, um, you know, I've, there's, a, there's a proverb about it you can, <laughs> or a saying about it you can, uh, if you need to go fast, go alone. If you need to go far, go with friends, right? So this idea that that our work, if we give each other feedback and we work together, can be so much more rich is really helped in virtual environments. It's much easier to collaborate in those environments. Um, metacognition. So this is the idea that, that learning requires reflection. It requires time for us to think. What have I learned? How does it relate to what I already know? What's the new thing that I'm thinking about? And where can I take it? So it's our, our human brains love to do these things. Uh, and if you teach online um, one unit over the course of an entire week, that gives students time to breathe, to learn, to think through. It gives you time as a teacher to see their comments, to hear their questions, to get to know what they're asking. Uh, and we all learn together and we learn together better when we have this opportunity to, to think and reflect, uh, especially in discussion forums, when we kind of reflect out loud and get some feedback from our peers. And then the final part uh, of virtual learning that, that I really love um, is differentiated learning. So this is one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou, um, super amazing human. Um, but in diversity, there is beauty and there is strength. Uh, if, we, if we focus on homogenous, single ways of knowing that come from, you know, from typically from white males in so much of our learning, uh, we're not getting the full picture. We're not getting the full rich picture. And this is especially important when we take a look at the faces of our learners in any class. No matter how many learners I have, they're all different. They all have different ideas and they all know things differently before they come to my class. How can I take advantage of that? How can I encourage them all to respect their differences that they each have? Uh, and then how can we use those differences to focus our learning? Uh, and virtually, we can do that in so many ways. If I have a student in my class who's super smart and who's getting all the things really very quickly, I can give that student more challenging um, resources, more challenging information. Uh, if I have a student who needs more support, who doesn't, who doesn't get the foundational concepts as quickly as another student, that doesn't mean that they don't have amazing talents in other ways. Uh, can they draw what they're trying to learn? Can they, can they speak it out loud? Uh, do they dance? Can they play? All those kinds of things that I want to know about my students that make them different and important. Um, they may not be good text readers. They may be, not be good test takers. Uh, but those sort of very narrow focused ways of demonstrating learning. Uh, if I respect the differences of my learners, I can start to open up my own teaching practice in my own mind um, to the ways that they bring important and great gifts to the teaching and learning process. So I wanna make sure that we've got time for questions, but I really just wanted to kind of introduce you to some of the ideas uh, about how and why virtual environments um, can be really great places to learn, even though there are technical challenges, and even though we may not feel like we're confident in our skills to do it, um, our students will be our partners in that. And that's where this differentiated learning comes into play. And so again, we're sharing these um, presentations in the course shell if you're taking the course, but I welcome um, questions by email and we'll talk in the discussion forum as well. So it's so nice to meet you uh, and thank you for your time in, in sort of doing this introduction.